fellow travelers, well met. The Green Scorpion here, happy to present another patron requested countdown. So, to my generous contributor, Charles Langley Jr., let me just say... You fool, you've doomed us all! That's right, for our quest today, we're releasing the brood and choosing the best of video games' most fearsome and majestic creatures, the dragons. I'm really excited about this one. The history of dragon mythos is fascinating, and I don't have the time to cover its sheer scope. To keep it brief, dragon mythology today descends from two major places, Europe and Asia. Western Hero Slays Dragon stories stem from many Hero Slays Serpent stories from the BC years, such as Indra vs. Vitria, Zeus vs. Typhon, and Thor vs. Jamangadur. But by medieval times, the idea of dragon morphed from giant snake to gargantuan winged lizard. Meanwhile, Eastern dragons took a more quadrupedal serpentine form, though they could usually shapeshift, and could have hair and even avian wings. While European dragons were animalistic threats and known to breathe fire, Asian dragons were usually above human intellect, often associated with water or rainstorms, and could be good or evil, appearing in several religions and symbolizing wisdom, power, and longevity. Through years of cultural cross-pollination, our most common variant of dragon formed in works like Tolkien's The Hobbit, and my favorite example, Dungeons & Dragons. With dungeons and treasure hordes to guard, dragons most popularly breathe fire, but some could wield ice, electricity, poison, or whatever else. They were a brilliant race of near immortals, and as characters could be just as morally complex as the humans and elves. There's more, so much more. But since we're not immortal ourselves, it might be better to move on and sprinkle my research over the next 10 entries. Suffice to say, dragons take on many forms, and while I have my preferences, and you'll notice a theme in the second half, I'll consider anything that the game wants to call a dragon. What's that, Freedom Planet? Lilacs a dragon? Sure, why not? So, put on your mithril armor and keep a cleric on standby, because this, my lads, is the Top 10 Video Game Dragons. Well, well, so nice to see you again. You won't feel that way for long! <laughs> That's big talk, little fire I'm in the camp that says dragons have been too downgraded in some video games. The first boss? The first mini-boss? Okay, some of these are really good for mechanics and conveyance, but it makes me thankful to games like Fire Emblem, which knows to reserve dragons as a big deal. But which one do I pick? Ninian and Nils? Kurt Naga? Maybe Grima? Well, I'll have to pick the original playable dragon, Tiki. Sorry, Bantu, but I'm going with Tiki on this one. So, for those of you unfamiliar, sure, she doesn't look like a dragon right now, but Tiki is one of the oldest of a race known as the Manakeet, dragons that can take human form. Dragons have a long history of doing this in other media, particularly in Chinese culture, where some in ancient times thought the pure-blooded to be descended from dragons. This is an interesting mirror to Western works. There, it was usually a person who became a dragon, like the cursed Prince Fafnir from Norse mythology, Eustace from the Chronicles of Narnia, or Disney's Maleficent. For the Manichaeans, it's neither a curse nor a weapon of evil. Actually, it's more like the Korean myth of the Yimugi, where the sun god would send to Earth a little girl who, upon turning 17, could take its true form as a water dragon. This is also why most playable Manichaeans are little girls. I said most, Bantu. Variations of the story say that Imugi could gain its full power by harnessing an orb called a Yoeju that fell from the heavens. The Manichaeans are like this in reverse. Long ago, Tiki's mother Naga saw that dragons were a threat to mankind, so she suggested that they all store their power within personal dragon stones and only use it when needed. This idea caused a rift between the Earth Dragon tribe and Naga's Manichaeans, who chose to spend most of their leisure in human shape. Naga worried about the Earth Dragon's wrath, but not nearly as much as Tiki, who had so much latent power that the only way to contain it was to have her sleep for half a millennium, guarded by Bantu, Gato, and Zane. But eventually, the evil Medeus finds her and manipulates her to fight Marth and the gang. Only with Bantu's guidance can Tiki be recruited to join Marth, whom she promptly gains an adorable crush on. Tiki is so powerful in Shadow Dragon and Mystery of the Emblem that it's stupid, 
with all of her stats capping at 20. Naga was right to be concerned, but that 500 year nap seems to have taken care of her destructive tendencies, so we're all good there. After the Arcanea Saga, she goes to sleep for another 2,000 years, partly out of sorrow, knowing that she'll outlive all of her new friends. And then, surprise, she's back in Fire Emblem Awakening, and it's... kind of poetic. Juxtaposed to her original, bubbly, quick-to-be-friend personality, this older Tiki is reserved and distant, but she'll still get out of bed to fight the Fell Dragon Grima. You'll probably end up not using her, because by this point you've had Noe for so long, but do yourself a favor and try her out in your next playthrough, she's pretty great. Or be like, nah, it's up to you. She'd never want to be called a goddess, but Tiki is a matriarch of the Fire Emblem series. And now her power is immortalized in Fire Emblem Heroes. Thrice! <laughs> If you're looking for something a little less cute, I'll direct you over to Dark Souls. No cuteness here. Well, maybe those basilisks, I don't know. The Soulsborne series has a number of dragons, and if I had to pick the best boss, I might go with Calamite. But as you know, I'm a big lore guy. I wanted the dragon credited with killing all other dragons, Seath the Scaleless. As the name suggests, Seath was born without metallic scales of most dragons, which also meant that he, unlike other dragons, was not immortal. The other dragons treated him like an outcast for this, because dragons are jerks. Seath wanted to get back at them, so he joined forces with Lord Gwyn, Gravelord Nito, and the Witch of Izalith to overthrow the tyrants. In typical Soulsborne fashion, not much about Seath is explained outright. The lore has to be compiled from various environmental details and item descriptions, but doing so points to Seath being the father of all sorcery. Gwyn rewarded him for his services by giving him a dukedom, which he transformed into a magical archive and continued his research into the mystical arts. Because if he couldn't be stronger than his brothers, he could at least be more magical. His most valuable discovery was the Primordial Crystal, which not only allowed Seath to finally gain that coveted immortality, but also was used to develop the Soul Arrow spell. If you play a mage, you have Seath to thank for this and it's probably a big part of how Seath turned the tides on his dragon brethren. Seath's positive contributions end there, however. With eternity at his disposal, he had no excuse to not understand every facet of the arcane arts, and the pursuit drove him mad. His creations, the Crystal Golems, roamed the lands collecting specimens for Seath to experiment on, and the toils of his labor can be seen in the monstrous, blubbering, tentacled mistakes that skulk around his castle. Seath, this needs to stop. The fight with Seath is pretty memorable. Seath meets you in the caves, not so much flying as crashing onto the battlefield. If I do have one complaint, I don't like how he moves. He just swivels awkwardly like a desk chair. But you can probably chalk that up to the warped state he's in. Much smaller than creatures like the Guardian Dragon, his skin shrivels around his visible ribs as he tries to encase scaleless hide in crystal, his body ending in more demented tentacles. What has science done? Oh wait, I just got it. A smaller dragon is bullied by bigger dragons, learns a bunch about magic, and comes back to crush them all with knowledge. This is Revenge of the Nerds with dragons. You have to destroy the Primordial Crystal first, which can be an annoying surprise for first-time players, but it's a common trope for the almighty dragon cliché, some special thing you have to do to make it vulnerable first. And overall, it's a neat fight, frantically getting hits in before the floor bursts into diamond spikes. More importantly, it's a lore fight, a rumble with one of the four Lords of Legend, and that's pretty momentous. And this boss has the decency not to completely suck. I'm looking at you, witch. The bed of chaos was bullcrap. Let's go back to something cute. Kirby! And more importantly, Landia from Kirby's Return to Dreamland. No epic story build up here. This was just cool. Well, okay, maybe there's some plot, I guess. You know something destroyed Magalore's ship before he crash-landed here, 
and Landia blasts it again when you follow Magalore to the planet of Halkandra. Here we see our first case of treasure hoarding on the list, a cherished dragon tradition. Landia also has the unique feature of four adorable heads. Multi-headed dragons have also been used in a lot of myth, taking inspiration from the Lernian Hydra or Orochi from Japanese mythology. But could the Hydra do this? When breathing lightning isn't enough, Landia splits itself into four single-headed mini-dragons, becoming more mobile and able to multitask. I have nothing there, that's just awesome. Though they share a single life bar, so that might have been some poor planning on your part, Landia. As so often happens in Kirby's adventures, Landia was just standing in the way of a greater evil, protecting the all-powerful Master Crown from thieves like Magalore who would misuse it. Seriously, half the time Kirby makes things worse before he fixes anything. But when it looks like Magalore has won, the Landia squad becomes Team Kirby's super speedy mounts, one for each hero. Well, that's convenient. Thus proceeds a 2D shooter between the Zippy Dragons and the Lore Star Cutter, which is just too amazing for words. There's a lot to like about Landia. I don't know how they managed to make it so cute and yet so imposing. And if you play in extra mode, you get to see it tap into the power of the Master Crown, which comes as a sinister recolor. Landia appears as the main antagonist of Kirby's Team Clash and Kirby's Team Clash Deluxe. I mean, it's like a fantasy RPG, they had to bring back their token dragon. Though the latter is a free-to-play money sink, by the time you get to him, you'll have given him a real treasure hoard to sit on. But overall, for the unique spin on some classic dragon ideas, Landia earns a four-way tie with itself for the number 8 spot. <sighs> oh boy. I knew I was gonna have to rank something from Monster Hunter at some point. The whole game is about giant beast encounters, some of the best of which are the Elder Dragons. The thing is... I really don't know a ton about Monster Hunter. I mean, I've talked about it before, so I can't hide behind my never played rule, but my choices are limited to the monsters I've experienced from random times playing on friends' save files. As always, if you have a better monster, unleash the comments. I understand a common favorite is the Gormagala and its adult form, the Shigaru Magala. The Tree's Apprentice actually talked about it before, and he describes it better than I could have. But the most exhilarating fight I bore witness to was the White Fatalis. Fatalis is a staple of the series, appearing since the first entry, and its kind is feared by all living things, even other Elder Dragons. Welcome to Castle Shrade, a desolate citadel with eternally dark skies, ruled by its one monstrous inhabitant. People aren't sure what happened to this once prosperous kingdom, whether disaster came from within, or if the keep fell to invasion. Personally, I think though Fatalis just moved in and decided he was king now. Though dangerous enough on its own, Fatalis has a couple of subspecies to be on the watch for, such as the Crimson Fatalis that lives deep in the volcanic craters. But come back to Castle Shrade in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, and you'll be treated to its pearly white cousin, and damn does he make an entrance. While the basic Fatalis is a creature of fire, White Fatalis can command a lightning storm, imbue its claws with electricity, and use the thunder sack in its chest to spit devastating bursts of energy from a long distance. This is how I expect the dragon to fight. Well, more or less. The monsters in this game aren't morons, but they're not the geniuses of Dungeons and Dragons either. It's guilty of some dragon boss design sins. Landing, doing its biting and tail attacks, and giving hunters plenty of opportunity to hack away at it before it takes flight again. As Spoonie says, dragons don't play fair. I expect them to stay airborne and sweep the field with breath attacks over and over again. But in Fatalis' defense, it really doesn't need to. It's endlessly aggressive, and its tail whips are seriously deadly, and it'll keep fighting on even if you smash its face in. No, really. This thing can have both of its eyes gored out, and it's still stubbornly insisting that you suffer tenfold before it leaves. I can't say with certainty that the White Fatalis is the best dragon in Monster Hunter. I mean, my personal favorite is the Kushala Daoda. But I'm not going back to Castle Shrade anytime soon. You can have it, man. Long live the king.
the following dragon is impossible to rank. In some ways, he really deserves to be number one. Going into the top five, we're talking about world threats, the epic draconian demigods, the stuff of legend. But when has there ever been a more pivotal video game dragon than Spyro? All of the other dragons on this list, even the cuter ones, are ancient beings or bringers of destruction. But Spyro... isn't. In fact, he was never meant to be. But I kept him in the middle, the top of the bottom five, because he deserves the recognition and God knows he hasn't had much in a while. The first Spyro game on the PlayStation 1 was kind of a parody story. You're on a quest, but instead of slaying the dragon, you are the dragon. That's a clever pitch. All of the big dragons you'd expect as bosses in other games are now collectible damsels encased in stone. But Spyro, the youngest of the brood, escaped the spell because he's just so gosh darn little. You're not exactly raising the countryside, but you're still doing all the things countrymen feared about dragons. Flying, breathing fire, recovering your life by eating livestock, that's hilarious by the way. And the best levels to me are the ones where you're running through a castle or war field, burning through waves of armored vanguards, incinerating tents, and chasing down those pesky thieves and wizards with a good headbutt. And if you think about it, you're storming keeps and hoarding treasure like a smog in training. The first two sequels are just as serviceable. Year of the Dragon and Hero's Tale got a little messy, and the Legend of Spyro series is a little polarizing. But I like how Spyro slowly gained all of these different elemental breath attacks, and I appreciate the newer developers trying to reboot him with a story that has some weight to it. Love him or hate him, they're the adventures of a gaming icon. Maybe the problem is that, at its foundation, Spyro just never had any weight to it. Like Sonic, it was just a silly concept made into a good game. But like many good games, we started projecting significance onto it and the developers felt obliged to live up to that. I mean, the first game begins with a TV interview, did we forget about that? It's hard to make this stuff serious. Actually, he's a lot like Sonic now that I think about it with that too cool for adults attitude that's a little tough to adapt outside of the 90s. Just unlike Sega, who kept shoving Sonic down our throats resulting in the occasional great game amongst the failures, Spyro was passed between developers like an unwanted foster child. Which brings us finally to Skylanders. Okay, calm down, I'm not hating Skylanders. Those games are actually a lot of fun, just something I never really got into. Spyro was used to kickstart this mega franchise, and it's pretty great, even if his new look is a little too DreamWorks for me. But after the initial release, Spyro's name was dropped from the title, and he just became one of the characters. And you know what? Spyro deserves better than that. Yeah, I know, they threw Crash in there too, and I appreciated that. But it's kind of like if after Kirby's Superstar, they made Kirby into the first Pokemon, and then kept him in the Pokedex and stopped making Kirby games. Pokemon would be just as good, but it'd be much worse for Kirby. So, here's what I'm thinking. Somebody, please, let's make a new Spyro game. Or at least HD remakes like Crash got. There's a generation of young Skylander fans who'd love to learn about his platforming roots. Maybe hand him over to Platonic. Just someone, please, let us be dragons again. You know what they say, for every good battle, you need a good adversary. And I felt that Nasty, in spite of his misguided nature, was a worthy opponent. Uh-oh. Here we go again! Now here's a game that knows how to make dragons a big deal. Skyrim. First of all, I just want to say that the lore behind the dragons in the Elder Scrolls is really cool. And I wish I had the time to talk about it all. Ow, what the hell? In this world, it's believed that dragons are not born. They just always have been and always will be. There's no baby dragons, no eggs, and as far as we can tell, they're as old as all creation. Then there's their style of magic. The draconic language is magic incarnate, so just speaking it with perfect diction bends the fabric of reality to one's liking. When two dragons are seen breathing fire and ice at one another, they're actually having a heated debate. To them, talking it out is fighting, and the toughest of all, Alduin, 
is said to have destroyed the last world and made room for this one, all because he just didn't like it that much. The game wastes no time establishing him as the antagonist. He interrupts your execution at the beginning of the game, flying overhead and raining down freaking meteors! And Bethesda grabs you by the shoulders and says, Hey, you see that? You're gonna fight it someday. That's the game! So, why is he showing up like this? Well, he's always raging against the humans, we just haven't seen him in a while. Many years ago, Mario, I mean Parthenax, shared the secrets of dragon power, and a war ignited with Alduin leading the dragons against the feeble mortals. He was unstoppable, so the only solution was to use the Elder Scroll and send him through time, causing him to emerge years later just as angry as he was when he had left. Yeah, way to go, Felder. Just procrastinate on slaying the World Eater, why don't ya? Now it's our problem. It doesn't help that Alduin's basically a Norse god, based on Nidhogg, the dragon that gnaws at the roots of the life tree Yggdrasil. Alduin has a similar penchant for eating bones, as well as reviving the dead dragons to compose a new dragon army. In true dragon fashion, Alduin doesn't fight with honor. Once again, he's invulnerable until you do the right thing. In this case, use the Dragon Wrench Shout, which was devised by Dragonkind itself. But until you use Dragon Rend, Alduin won't even bother landing. He's not too proud to spray and pray from above, and he's not gonna land unless you make him. For as smug as he is, he can be a real coward when the tables are turned, which just makes me enjoy slaying him more. Alduin is going to be our benchmark here for world-threatening Mega Dragons. He's a pain in the tail, but he does the Dove proud. There is a metric ton of Dragon-type Pokémon I could choose from, plus a few Dragons that inexplicably aren't Dragon-type. Yeah, I counted these. But while Flygon, Hydreigon, and Dragonite, and Garchomp are all really interesting, and poor Giratina, this is the second time it's just narrowly missed a countdown, I don't think anyone will be surprised to see Rayquaza in this spot. Delta Episode What Have You Done? Most legendaries have a prescribed role. Shaman spreads purifying flowers, Manaphy's the Prince of the Ocean, and Lugia's got his elemental bird posse, but Rayquaza is pulling double duty. Not only does he patrol the Earth's ozone layer, protecting the planet from incoming asteroids or alien threats, he also has to pop back to Hoenn whenever Groudon and Kyogre are fighting, so he can balance out the world's weather with its airlock ability. No wonder this thing is seen as a god. No, really, in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, we find out that the Draconids built their religion around him. It makes a lot of sense, really. Like any legendary, Rayquaza is a treasure trove of mythological inspiration. The most often cited is Ziz from Jewish texts, the King of Birds and the Master of the Sky, with Groudon as Behemoth and Kyogre as Leviathan. But design-wise it has more in common with Chinese dragons, specifically the ones written by the Xian, or Enlightened Ones, in Taoist mythology. Brings more meaning to you writing Rayquaza into space, doesn't it? Or that time subspace emissary stuck him in some random lake, seriously what was that all about? I guess Sakurai saw him as more of a traditional Japanese river dragon, or like a Nordic sea serpent. Most interesting to me, there's Quetzalcoatl, an Aztec serpent god who defined the boundaries of land, sea, and sky. That sounds a lot like the Emerald Dragon to me. But no amount of international worship could convey his divine rule over the tier lists. Rayquaza's been eating so many space rocks that he has the power of a Mega Stone in his belly, allowing him to Mega Evolve and still keep an item slot open for Life Orb, Choice Scarf, or whatever else you want. That's just... Game Freak. Do you hate your own rules? His new Delta Stream ability protects flying types from super effective hits, remember Ziz, King of Birds, and like all Pokemon, he has a diverse move pool that gives him the most elemental range of any dragon on the list, with access to moves like Hyper Voice, Blizzard, Thunder, Fire Blast, Solar Beam, Toxic, Earthquake, Shadow Claw, Rock Slide, Surf, and did I mention Draco Meteor? I thought about him for Aeromancers, but there's just too much stuff going on with him. 
You didn't need me to tell you all this. You knew Rayquaza was broken, but maybe you never thought about this. Rayquaza's base stat total is 680, and when you Mega Evolve it, it's 780, tied with Mega Mewtwo X and Y for the highest in the game surpassing even Arceus, creator of the known universe. No Pokemon alone surpasses Arceus, but when you and Rayquaza team up, you have the strength to topple a god. Just maybe not a fairy. Supposedly, Alduin destroyed the world once, though that's really just legend and Rayquaza probably could raise some serious pandemonium, but chooses to be a protector. If you want to see Draconian devastation firsthand, then I present to you... Deathwing the Destroyer. Deathwing is like Alduin on a larger scale. And with larger scales. It starts with background. While Alduin's name shows up in some lore text in previous Elder Scrolls games, Deathwing has been an active part of the Wars of Azeroth since Warcraft 2. He also has the most pronounced jawline I've ever seen. Look at his human form, he looks like Baron Underbite. But he wasn't always so evil. Deathwing was once a black worm named Nalfarian, who helped four other proto-dragons battle their evil dragon daddy Galakrond. The Titans rewarded these five by making them the dragon aspects, each with their own flight of different colored dragons, and each maintaining an important function in Azeroth. One was made the Guardian of Magic, another the Keeper of Time, Neltharion became the Earth Warder, managing the planet that all civilization would be built upon. Pretty important stuff, and he did a pretty good job with it. But beings called the Old Gods had to screw it all up, psychically whispering to him and driving him mad, all in part of a convoluted plot to get themselves free. The details aren't important. The point is, Neltharion became spiteful and vicious, but no less cunning. He tricked the other four dragon aspects into channeling some of their power into an artifact called the Dragon Soul, then used said Dragon Soul to kick their tails. His power may have been second to Alexstrasza, the Lifebinder, but he managed to manipulate a tribe of dragon shamans, get her imprisoned, and take her dragon flight for his own. He was temporarily defeated by the Alliance, but it wouldn't be the last time we saw him. Deathwing used every trick of the trade, hiding in alternate planes, trading his children, hiding caches of dragon eggs in Draenor, and faking his own death on several occasions. He took a new human form as Lord Prester, and wheeled his way in to become a trusted member of the Alliance, all while fueling the fires of the Horde and contributing to some of Gen Greymane's more questionable decisions. When it was time for him to come back into the limelight, dear God did he. Thus began the Shattering. In the Cataclysm expansion, Deathwing isn't even an enemy anymore. He is a storm, a force of nature. Just him flying overhead tears the land asunder. Alliance versus Horde? Doesn't matter anymore, Deathwing won't stop until either he dies, or everything else dies. Even new players on the overworld were in constant peril of a flyby scorching. He went so far as to have the goblins sew plates of elementium into his hide. The pain unimaginable, but the fury so much stronger. And once again, only one thing could even start to bring him down. The Dragon Soul. It took the Dovahkiin and a small band of slayers to take down Alduin, but it took 10 to 25 men on the front lines to end Deathwing. Unless you're one of those obsessives who solos dungeons. And that's only after Thrall used the soul and tried to kill steal the entire world. The party rides his spine, chipping away at his corrupted additions until he pummels to the ground for the final showdown. Sure, Deathwing has to spend more time hiding and fleeing than Alduin did, but that's only because the power economy in Azeroth is a hell of a lot higher than in Tamriel. And if you really want to see what would have happened, the End Time Dungeon event gave us a good look of the world if Deathwing won. All the land scorched, all life eviscerated, the Deathwing's dead body impaled upon the Wormist Temple, satisfied in death as long as the world felt the same torment he felt every day. He may not have been the most interesting villain compared to Arthas the Lich King, but from my casual perspective, 
the World of Warcraft has never been so close to total ruin. Number two was the biggest surprise for me. Not a character I normally think of as a dragon. But after looking through all of the games that I could, I realized that the captain of the space pirates was going to be a serious contender for the top spot. So, first question. Is Ridley eligible? I honestly don't see why not. Claws, tail, wings, flaming breath. He might be the only character on this list not referred to as such, but he is a bona fide dragon. He just also happens to be an alien and a pirate. An alien dragon pirate. Named for director Ridley Scott, this demonic pterodactyl is a famed general of the vicious space pirates. They're not some small-time plunderers either. The Space Pirates are an organized, militarized galactic threat that's been tormenting the Federation for decades. I'm going to assume that he runs the whole thing, alongside Mother Brain if she happens to be alive that week. He can fight like a monster, but he's a tactical genius and a real jerk when you get to know him. It's lucky you usually fight him in enclosed spaces because he'll just glide around and bomb you if he has the opportunity. To think that his species starts life as this adorable, if rather off-putting, puffball. And then this weird alligator thing. Uh, look, get it off of me. Grown up, Ridley follows his own version of the Draconic Burnin' loot. Just, instead of medieval villages, it's space colonies. Instead of being alone, he's accompanied by a team of pirates. And instead of gold and gems, he takes the last baby Metroid. He's not the world ender that Alduin and Deathwing are, but when you think about it, most of the planets and space stations he's seen on eventually self-destruct. But while he is mighty and merciless, what makes him a great dragon isn't his physical qualifications, even if he can comfortably survive the vacuum of space. It's more his role in the series and his relationship to Samus. Ridley isn't just a literal dragon, he is a symbolic dragon. Check TV tropes and it will define the dragon of a story to be a big bad's top enforcer, or a big physical threat the hero must surpass before entering the finale. Ridley is this, perennially. Though the final boss changes per game, Ridley is almost always ready to serve as its dragon, even unintentionally at times. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Ridley has served as number two for Mother Brain twice, Metroid Prime twice, the SAX, and whatever you consider other M's final boss to be. But more importantly, Ridley is Samus's dragon. Ever since he killed her parents and decided that she was too insignificant to bother crushing, these two have been locked in an ongoing struggle with seemingly no end. He gets blown apart in Metroid, only to return with a cybernetic body in Prime, get empowered with Phazon in Prime 3, and somehow return to his normal organic self before his final death in Super Metroid. This is speculated to be due to an impressive healing factor, where he regenerates after devouring his targets. Even after his death, he haunts Samus, and not just psychologically. A clone of him shows up in Other M, and the X-Virus copies his DNA in Metroid Fusion. Not to mention, the Space Pirates have a robot version of him in Zero Mission. His constant resurrection might be outside of his control, these aren't even the same Ridley anymore, but it's the same to Samus. And somehow the clones seem to know that these fights are personal, because he likes to greet her by sadistically waxing her against the wall. Seriously, he's done this in no less than three games. You thought I was dead? <laughs> yeah, nice try. Did you work hard collecting those Chozo artifacts? Well, I just blew them all up. Oh, and by the way, I went back and ate your parents. He may be too big for Smash Brothers, but he's just right for the number two spot. All this anticipation and I don't even know where to start with our number one. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. Bahamut.
This is my fourth time using a Final Fantasy Summon as an entry, and it hasn't gotten any easier. The omnipresence of these espers through the series makes them notable, but in a franchise like this, their role is ever-changing, yet somehow transcending continuities, they absolutely must be appreciated as one singular character. Or maybe that's the wrong word, because Bahamut isn't a character. Not all the time. Bahamut is a theme. A power. So, let's dive into the series and overcome this last dragon. The best dragons are introduced early to build anticipation for later encounters, but Bahamut isn't fightable for the entire first game. He just sits beneath Cardia Islands. You fight elementals, time-traveling super wizards, and the avatar of chaos in this game. But in what was supposed to be a quintessential fantasy adventure, the game seems to say, no, you wouldn't have a chance. Instead, he lends you his power, giving you the first class promotions in the series. I know these pixels don't hold up, but in the 80s, this felt huge. Summoners were first introduced in Final Fantasy III with all the standards like Shiva and Ifrit, but Bahamut was the top summon and one of those notables that demanded a fight first to prove your worth. Here he first displays his signature attribute, his flare abilities. These massively damaging explosions have no element, because who cares if you're fireproof, this is gonna hurt! After this point, Bahamut reoccurred as a summon, generally being the strongest one with some extra trial required to optionally wield him. Leviathan in Final Fantasy IV was the king of the Eidolons, but Bahamut doesn't even answer to him. He just waits on the moon and won't even consider aiding Rydia until every other summon is acquired. I love this guy! Summoning him is like a contract, it's always on his terms. In Final Fantasy IV Interlude, at one point he realizes that his summoner is an imposter Rydia and just dismisses himself. And in the after years, he decimates his summoner when he decides he doesn't like what he's being used for. In five, he's still a big deal, sealed within the earth and only freed by two realities crashing together. In six, he's a little more downplayed, probably because there's already a big dragon side quest. But seven ups the ante with new, more powerful forms. Meet Bahamut Neo and Bahamut Zero. This dragon just became a Death Star. And by this point, Bahamut's ongoing role has shifted to that of a weapon perhaps best explored in 9. At birth, he was assigned to be Garnet's summon, like he was in the past games, but gets extracted by Queen Braun and used by Kuja. The kingdom would have been toast if Alexander weren't the coolest castle ever. Again in 10, he's more of a tool and now a required collectible in the story. The final Aeon needed to confront Sin, but damn if he isn't my favorite design! So imposing, he crosses his arms, and we finally got some feathery wings like a Japanese dragon. Cool! The most recent single-player adventures see Bahamut more as a motif, or an entity to draw power from. Vayne combines with Vinat and parts of the Sky Fortress Bahamut to gain dragon wings and mega flare attacks in his final form. Twintania draws power from a dormant Bahamut, Caius transforms into Chaos Bahamut, and summons Bahamut backups, and while 15 is still a little too new to spoil, I'll just say it continues the trend, and then some. And that's skipping over tons of other appearances. Fang's Eidolon that turns into a jet in 13, Lunar Bahamut in 4 Advanced, Revenant Wings where he's a Dragon Dragoon, a doofy boss battle in Super Mario RPG, his oddly talkative rendition in World of Final Fantasy, or his own game, Bahamut Lagoon. Bet you never heard of that one. As his entry in Dissidia states, with so many incarnations through the years, calling Bahamut as just a dragon can't fully describe him. He's a symbol. He's passed on to the legends of these games the same way dragons passed into our real-world mythology, formless and boundless with only some shared ideas to connect them into a standard definition. But maybe that's cheating. Maybe that's not dragon enough for this list. Or maybe you prefer to think of all these as different beasts of the same name that shouldn't share the top spot. Alright, I'll humor you. One singular dragon at number one. What's that in the sky? The ball of impending doom. Is it a Majora's Mask ripoff? 
No. It's Primal Bahamut, bursting out of his 4,000-year prison and mad as hell. Alduin allegedly destroyed the world once. Deathwing nearly destroyed the world. But Primal Bahamut, he did it. He destroyed the world. In fact, he destroyed an entire reality. And it's canon. And it's beautiful. If I had to, this alone would secure him in the top five. But that's not even the end. When their last hope for defense fails, when all of the MacGuffins are shattered, one brave wizard rallies the last of his strength and sacrifices himself to take Bahamut down with him, protecting a few heroes and using the Phoenix Primal to allow the realm to be reborn and the MMO to have a second chance at greatness. It's the ultimate reboot. So that kills Primal Bahamut, right? Not for long. In Heaven's Ward, you can head to the Colas of Bahamut, a dungeon comprised of the remains of the dragon and his prison Ragnarok. And amongst the many defenses are a restored wizard and phoenix, which Bahamut has now corrupted and used to make itself stronger. Bahamut died, and used its death to come back stronger. Like freaking Doomsday! If it needed to be, Primal Bahamut from Final Fantasy XIV could more than fill the top spot. But I say it shouldn't have to. The legacy of this character is as grand and omnipresent as the franchise itself. He's filled just about every role he can. Sage, Monster, Protector, Destroyer, Mount, Pet, Boss, Weapon, Force of Nature, and Apocalypse! And I can't think of a better way to exemplify the legend that is Dragon. I'm the Green Scorpion, thank you, and good night. Hey everyone, the Green Scorpion here. Thank you so much for watching this very, very long video. And if you did, go ahead and like and subscribe if you want to. I'm not going to go through that whole spiel, I honestly don't like doing that. But uh, this is coming out on Thanksgiving, which I did not plan, but then again, I also didn't plan for my laptop to die. I've been working on this since before that. But either way, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be going through a few changes, making a few transitions, still getting used to the new system from here on out, hopefully establishing a schedule a little bit better than I have been. But um, in the meantime, I hope you guys uh, continue to enjoy the Green Scorpion, and I hope to see you guys here in the next video. Peace out, take care.